Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. I have the honor of having Mr. Tony McAlpine here with me. Tony, thank you so much for hey, Rick. Thanks coming for to having visit. Me. Tony's in town playing and uh, came by the studio here to have a visit and talk a little bit. Yeah, I did. I came by and um, cleaned out your driveway too. <laughs> big storm you guys have had here. So much water. A lot of water. <laughs> so Tony, you have been touring and playing since really the early 80s, mid 80s. Yeah, touring since the later 80s, later recording 80s. in the early 80s. Yeah. And through this entire time, you've always kept your piano chops up. And you're always p playing, you play in your records, do things I do. like that. Tell me about that, about why you've decided to keep that up your whole life and and to continue recording and doing uh playing the piano well you know the piano it's just really an essence of, of of my starting point as a musician I mean I started with uh, piano when I was five years old and um, I'm always returning to the piano you know it's a creative source for me I'm um, probably right 90% of the things that I do musically or or work anything out with on the piano that's so symphonic and it's rhythmic and can't really achieve that same difference with 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 a guitar so it's a, it's an important place for me to to go to a source of inspiration. Yeah. Okay, so compared to guitar, what's what's more difficult to play, the guitar or the piano? I don't think that there's a I mean like traditionally now I'm doing both at the same time. I was doing that in Steve Weiss band and I'm doing it more so now. Yeah, playing guitar and playing, yeah, like, yeah. playing the I other hand of the piano. It's, they're playing. relatively the same. You know, instrument. Um I think really just just being warm as a player, it's a physical thing, more physical with the piano. Less so with the guitar. Um, I, I think they're, they're equal to me, really. If you, if you have a good understanding of what you're trying to say musically, then it's going to come out of the instrument. If not, then it's going to be discombobulated. What's the most challenging thing to play on the piano? Um, anything that you don't know well. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have to play something live for somebody that you don't know, then that's, yeah, that's, that's a challenge. Anything that you're sure of is, is, is beautiful and it's going to be relaxing and, and entertaining for them. Did you take the things that you knew on piano when you started playing guitar and start adapting them to guitar, or did you learn the guitar as a separate instrument? Um, I, it, it was pretty much an escape for me, because when I started piano, I was reading only. Yeah. You know? um, and when I got into guitar, it was a type of thing where I was you know, improvising a lot. Yeah. So the two things came from two different places, and the, it was just like a mixture of both. You know, why do you think that improvising, which classical musicians and composers used to do, Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, mm. they always improvised. Uh, why do you think that that disappeared from classical music? I don't know. I, I I don't have the answer. I mean, but you know, it hasn't fully um, you know disappeared in terms of um, recital play when concert artists play. I mm -hmm. mean, they make lots of different liberties and. Transitions and ways they interpret it. Yeah, Horowitz made sometimes, a career out of it. Not, not on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, you know, like for instance, Horowitz had this. You know, if you went to the uh, these, he would add the the D flat. You know, um, many of the Chopin like. You know, that kind of thing. Um, it's not in the literature that way, but it became an essence of his sound. Mm -hmm. And it would seem easy enough for somebody to be able to, to do it, but they couldn't do it the same way, exactly mm -hmm. the way. So, um, yeah, I think improvisation was... Uh, and he used to say himself, it's not important. It's just it's character. <laughs> you know, it's not important that I do it, but it's just character. It's important that you don't do it, however. So um, improvisation is an important tool for understanding what works in music and what doesn't work. I think. How do you remember pieces like that? Gosh, I, I don't know where it comes from. You know, I played so many of them. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and I enjoy them. I remember things that I enjoy. I don't remember well, um, you know, vice versa. But if I but if I enjoy it, it's not a problem for me to tell the story again. So if you were to sit down and play something, uh, you know, you you sit down at a piano and what's the what do you like to play things you haven't played in a while or what do you what do you do? Yeah, I mean, I haven't played. Um, like right now, I, I I've been hearing, you know, Ulak Valenstadt Franz Liszt. I, I haven't played this thing in a thousand years. Let's sing. not the real fiery thing so. but yeah you know I don't think it gets out of you it's always there you you read so much stuff it, it makes like an imprint in your, your musical soul that's that is really great it's enjoyable okay so on guitar yeah. you play seven string I do and you you went to seven string a long time ago I did back in the Planet X days when I was um, yep. in the band with uh, Virgil Lunati and yep. And Derek Sherinian, and um, that was a, a necessary element of sound that they needed. So I first said, "Let me just turn down the, you know, the E string," and that didn't work. So I had to learn how to really put that together. It came pretty quick though. It's, an, it's a natural fit for me, um, neck-wise and um, harmonic-wise. I mean, you have massively big hands. How far can you reach? Can you reach uh, an eleventh? I think tenth's easy, yeah. right? Yeah. I think it is for everybody. But, um... Yeah. <laughs> to get an 11th, that's, uh, that's pretty Yeah, pretty tough. It, it's important with the, uh, you know, with the arpeggios. Yeah, being yeah. able to, yeah, move your hands over. If you have little hands, it's kind of difficult, but they play, little hands play Bach and Mozart very well. Mm hmm yeah, cause... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the seven string a little bit because I'm always yeah. fascinated by people that went to the seven string early. Because I interviewed Steve Vai recently, yeah, known and played with forever, yeah. and Steve really was was uh, one of the earliest people on the seven string guitar. Yeah, yeah, and he was. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of the bands nowadays were influenced by that. You know that. You know, before even a lot of people think, oh, new metal is when seven strings happen. No, seven strings were way back, yeah, in, yeah, back in the eighties, yeah, and uh, extended range, yeah, yeah, extended range. Okay, yeah. but you were, we were talking a little bit earlier about eight string guitars. What do you think about them? Well, I, I, I you know, I utilize them in the studio mm -hmm. for uh, filling out, you know, tones of things and subharmonic sounds. But in a live format for me, it's not really quite that useful because I'm getting down in the neighborhood of the bass player yeah. and, um, you know, the, the, the subwoofers which just bring out these tones. I can't keep the lower strings quiet, you know. Yeah. So to, to me, it's not really... To go the other way, it's kind of valuable to me. To go down there of just bass players and musicians, you know, you use are so competent with, with that range that they don't need your help, you know. Right. <laughs> Yeah, down there, and it sounds nicer for me that I can hear the the blending of a lower bass instrument with a guitar that's more tenorish. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um, nice when they occupy their own ranges. Beautiful, and then when you get two guitar players, for instance, like you know now we have you know Emil Versler. Yeah. And he has a very unique sound, mm -hmm. and the two of us playing like the same things together. Yeah, it's just, it's 
it's a, it's a nice ambiance. It's a nice it's a nice collection of activity. But then then, you know, both of us, uh, neither of us are playing eight strings, and it's it's pretty much void in my music mel melodic wise. Mm -hmm. but, you know, but from a standpoint of where the harmonies are at, yeah, it's it's there with rhythm tracks. If you were going to learn the guitar nowadays, okay, right. starting from scratch, how would you learn it differently? Would you? Who knows? Um, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I don't know. It's hard for me to know what I would do differently, but... Um, Are there technical things that you would learn differently? Well, you know, I I think I would have seen more stuff, you know, in you know in the media world. I mean, I would have seen, like, you know, videos and different types of things. That right. I figured out a lot of things wrong mm -hmm. when I was, um, you know, coming on. But I think... Uh, as we were talking about the 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 opportunity of doing that and putting yourself in that position kind of creates some you know character yeah of sound for you because necessarily somebody's wrong might be your right or vice versa but for me it was just I did things the way I thought they were really were and then I'd play in front of somebody else and like what are you doing that's not how it's done it's something like this <laughs> like yeah but um I don't know what I would have done differently I, pr I probably would have um. Probably would have jammed more with with with, with players. Mm -hmm. I think I've, I've never I'm known for not being a a guy to show up at the jam party or the open mic session. I really like organized music. That's why yeah. I you know write my instrumentals that way. And but I've never been one for like you know the uh, you know the NAM show jam that goes on for 16 hours. Right. Now oh, this guy's going to come up and that I, guy's. Gonna I come never up. go to those. <laughs> I, I stay away from those. I like watching it. I love jam. I, I love jamming. I love watching people jam, but but. Nam jam is not my thing. Yeah, yeah. me either. Me either. Uh, do you think that uh, studying the piano first, too, you know, influenced as far as the the uh, the compositional side of of what you do on the guitar? Oh, I think so, because you know, um, harmonically, I, I I was able to read things and then and then see them, you know, and 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 I was never afraid to. Uh, transpose things in different keys, mm -hmm. and then look at the guitar in the same linear fashion as um, as, as the keyboard was able to do for me. Because you know the the guitar, when you look at it, it's a lot of positions, and there's so many different ways to do one thing. You know, there's only one way. Which is why it's hard to read on, harder to read on guitar, because totally you can play the same that. thing yeah. in so many different exactly. places. Exactly. How is your guitar reading, by the way? It's fine. I mean, I I read the music that I read, uh, charts that I make are. You know, created on the on the uh, keyboard, so I'm basically reading what piano music looks like. Uh, when I joined the band Cab with Dennis Chambers and Bunny Burnell way back when, I couldn't really read the charts, so I didn't. You Dennis know, doesn't read though either, though, does he? I don't think he does. I, I, he's not reading what I'm reading. You know, the drum chart. I don't even know, but I. Yeah. You know, um, Bunny's <laughs> like, yeah, here, play this G flat five chord, and you know, and I'm like, what are these symbols? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, shut up. You can play eight twos, and you can't read that. I had to learn to. You know what the symbols were. I just was not really a good tablature guy or anything like that. Yeah. What do you think about tablature? It's it's a method. It's a way to show people things. Yeah. But you know, um, but I you think th if you don't have a good ear, it's really important to be able to develop it to to make it stronger, so that you don't really have to read something to figure it out. It's important to you learn it more internalized, deeper, if you can, you know, hum what that melody is. Would you suggest that everyone learns how to play the piano if they can, if they have the opportunity to? I don't know. Um, I, I don't. I don't know if that's. I just. I think it's important that everybody just loves music. I mean, it doesn't really have to be the piano because the the problem with the piano is that you know you got the two hands. Right. You know, and uh, being able to separate those two sounds is 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 the battle, um, and that makes a lot of people shy away. From, from it and go towards an instrument like a guitar where just one hand's doing the chordal work and one hand is strumming. Um, I never thought in a million years I'd be doing both of them together. Right. But um, I, I don't know if it's all that necessary. I think it's, I think, I think research is important today for younger players. Being able to find out who did something before and why they did it. Yeah. Because that's the, what we had to do. When, yeah, that's what we had to do when we were in school. You had yeah. to, you know, if you played a nocturne or whatever it was, you had to find out why was the piece written. Yeah, you know what? What was the what was what was the reason that the piece was? What, what was the meaning behind it? You had to read the story, then you interpret it. And I kind of write my instrumentals that way now. I mean, the songs have a they have a meaning, and we play them with different character. You know, it's something that we really push. 
How important is your own personal gear to you as far as your sound? And for example, is it difficult to play if you don't hear what you're expecting to hear out of your amplifier, your guitar? Is it difficult to play? It is, but I think more so is really the um, the physicality of the instrument because you, you don't really want to have a filter between you, yourself, and, 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 and the path when this you know this creativity comes in. So playing my own gear, I don't have to think about it. I know what it's going to feel like. And I know what I'm going to feel like when my hands are cold and I'm playing it, or yeah. so, you know, vice versa, if I'm warm. Uh, playing something that I'm not used to playing, I have to fight, figure it out at the same time, fight that kind of thing, and, oh, this is, this is, what, this is how this instrument reacts. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing I don't like. Um, and what about the reaction of the guitar with the amplifier about controlling that sound? That's very important, right, to playing. Yeah, for me, it's um, I use some, um, you know, Hughes and Kettner core blades. There's a lot of power in these heads, and I like harnessing yeah. the power and getting this kind of, um, you know, driven speaker um, distortion as well as the feedback gain and all that. Um, and I don't really use anything in front of the, you know, the input of the amp. So it's really all tube sound, and it's really happening. So, you know, you play this harmonic, you get this semblance of sound one time, it's not going to happen again the same way because it's not sampled it's not modeled it's that that's that's the thing that i'm kind of used to um i'm like you know the old guy that still uses the tube amps so, um, <laughs> you're talking to the wrong yeah. you're talking to the right guy here man yeah you know? yeah what is that behind us <laughs> yikes <laughs> i uh you know i i i don't mind the, the modelers or things like that but if i have the choice of playing through a tube amp and or not i'm going to play through the tube amp period Luckily, I have the choice here. Yeah, you do. You have the choice. I mean, well, so it's a beautiful but, day. But, but I always felt that if I don't like my sound, it's a real impediment to playing. I, it's hard to improvise, especially improvising. Yeah. If you don't like your sound, if it doesn't sound good to you, it inhibits your playing, I think. It does. It does. I mean, we have a lot of lines and we have a lot of, um, you know, compositional um, things that we have to follow suit with and play every night that that have to pretty much be the same mm -hmm. um and when i'm soloing i i feel differently each night so i i always say you know, you know the title of the solo is going to be the same as what you heard yeah but then i you know i might change the story a little bit that's where the improvisation comes in and if i'm not relaxed enough with the instrument and the sound it's hard to achieve that but by using my gear all the time then that, that doesn't happen so i mean i have levels of where i play and emil and i talk about that quite a bit mm -hmm. You know, there's levels to this, he says, you know, it's like you, you can feel super creative one night and you quickly learn right away, you know, when it's not happening. So mm -hmm. you can fall into that mode where, okay, let's just go back to the solo that's on the record. Right. And I know that. But when you're like way out of the box and you want to be creative and wild, you can just, you know, take a chance. Okay. So who are your favorite guitar players? Who are your favorite players growing up? You know, it's, yeah, it's well known. I loved Johnny Winter. Yep. And I was a huge, I'm still George Benson fan. Yep. And... You know, between that and, and listening to music, I you know, the music that I had to read and when I was in the Springfield Conservatory and, um, you know, Van Halen came about, you know, as I was listening to that. And mm -hmm. I listened to the normal diet of what it was, but I was never really obsessed with it because I was always trying to figure out. The thing that I liked about these players is like how they developed this personality. And I was really always trying to, you know, marry that within myself because like develop my own kind of feel my own my own uh, way of playing things and, and getting a sound that's um uh knowing the lineage of players mm. you know when you're talking about classical music mm. understanding uh, i used to teach jazz studies and part of teaching jazz studies is to to actually you know if you were to talk about George Benson, well, you have to know about Charlie Christian. Exactly. And then you have to know about Django, and then you yeah. have to know about, you know, you, sure. you actually follow these players. Yeah, you led down that road. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was a that was always a big thing of that I would always tell my students as well, yeah. you know, you have your modern players, but where did they get their in influences from? You have to go back and listen to their records and become familiar with that. Exactly. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, the historical side and the research and what motivated them and and how they changed it along the way. Yeah. You know, that's your that's your job as a player. Do you think that the guitar is, um, I mean, obviously there's all this pedagogy with the piano that's been developed over the last mm -hmm. 200 years or so. 
when I turn on Instagram, you'll see people doing some mm -hmm. crazy things, different things, yeah. playing the guitar in different ways. Do you yeah. think that that eventually that will be exhausted in a certain way? I mean, really, has piano pedagogy changed in the last 50 years that much? Yeah. Yeah, it has. Of course, it's gone through... I mean, if you look at how the, you know, the in the 1960s, how um, pretty much all the European pianists had this certain sound, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so Maurizio Polini was was the youngest competitor at 1960 when he won the Chopin competition, and every pianist after that had to have that same sound, mm -hmm. you know, that, that infinite um, clarity and tone, but if you went back a few decades earlier than that, uh, you know, um, you know, Rubenstein had something that was completely different. Yeah. But nobody was copying that anymore because when they put the records on, they heard all this hiss. Right. You know? <laughs> so they didn't know how to, you know, they'd never had the opportunity to see Rubenstein. Yeah. Live. And of course, when people did see him, he was far older. Yes, And he wasn't true. really at, the, you know, the powers of where he was at. But then a lot of the younger players today, now it's going back to to where it was. You have Yu Jia Wang and, you yeah. know, you have these wonderful youngsters that are, forget the rules. Yeah. You know, they're playing it the way they they feel it should be. I think that's a freshness that was needed a long time ago. It came a little too late because um, music needs to be idolized by the young to survive. And it didn't have that with, you know, with the classics. It didn't have it. It was, it was you know, the funding came from mature people. Right. And, and um, you know, you had to dress a certain way. When you looked at Ivo Pogorelic, like he came in to do a concert. He had jeans on and a, you know, blue velvet shirt. He goes, people don't need to be looking, you know, at me. They need to be just listening to the music. So, you know. Of course, music is still, the, in the classical world, it's still being funded by older people. Yeah. For the most part. Yes, but but now that because it, it's, there's such a, um, you know, there's not as many um, schools with the same amount of attendance that they used to have. You know, there, there's room for artists to be free and individual now. It's getting back into that. And, yeah. Um, it's going to take a lot, though, to reach the, the, the kids. Because the kids are in an electronic age, you know. Yeah, and they don't They don't like... Uh, <laughs> don't like learning. They don't like learning. They don't like all those uh, all those real instruments either. No, they don't. And they'd rather <laughs> just, um, you know, push a button and sample this and sample that. and Which I don't know what I would be like if I grew up in a time where I had all this electronic, you know things to, to pull me away from what I was trying to do but because um, we didn't have that I mean a toy, what was a toy for us a stick and a hoop or something like that you know? <laughs> it's like chase that around the yard for two hours and you get bored with it you know? a stick and a hoop that's, yep. that's, uh, that was pretty much it yeah. that's, that's what would keep me going back in to play my guitar and stuff it's like I okay, guess boring yeah I'm you're chasing this thing guitar. around come on <laughs> enough of that <laughs> But don't you think that that has definitely has something to do with it as far as when we were growing up that there was there were not any of those distractions at all? Absolutely, that was my entertainment to yeah. to, to be in there just for hours and and to. So if you had an iPad back then, your life could be very different. I don't have an iPad now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be. It would be. I I I think so. Although I was I was not much of a gamer, you know. Yeah. But um, definitely fascinated with um fascinated with this stuff today I mean just being able to work in the studio you know that we have and to take our time and and everything is non-destructive this is the that's the best part of that's today. the best part of it yeah yes is that yeah. you can you can do things you know anywhere yeah I, I you know we'll write ideas down on a little miniature keyboard I'll be on the plane pop that thing out but when you were yeah. when you were making records you know yeah back in the 80s yeah and you were in a, you had to go to a studio to make them yeah, it's big, uh, and and it was pressure. Yeah, because you had to perform during that studio time. That was expensive. Yeah, yeah. You had the tape, the nine nine six tape. You had a, a the heads had to be with bias and cleaned and all yeah. that stuff. It's not like now where you can do three hundred takes or whatever you want to do. Not yeah. that, not that you would do that, Tony. It's your one take. No, I'm not. I, <laughs> I mean, because I can't really. You know, it takes me a while to come up with like the concept of what a record needs to sound like and then mm -hmm. it takes me a while to come up with the, the choice of the instruments and then I don't like the idea of like a record having so many different characteristics of sounds mm -hmm. I like it to have kind of like one sound because if you know if you're going to get sushi you, you want to buy sushi you don't yeah. want to one track sounds like a hamburger joint and the next thing it's an ice cream shop I like one sound right on, on, on the record and today you know you look at these amplifiers you get 128 presets you I can know. do all of these things that I'd never really even used live you know yeah 
So I think it's uh, a, one amp, one sound. One amp, one sound, and that, that <laughs> but that's the time uh, for me is like when I'm when I've written the song and I and I have the component of the lines, the verse, the chorus, what if, whatever. But when I get to the solos, um, it takes me a while because I take I do more than one solo, and I don't like the idea of mixing stuff. I mm -hmm. like the idea of just playing it. Yeah. But picking what I think best fits, because I'm not afraid to have you know things that sound very human in there, because mm -hmm. that gives a character. I think that's one of the things we miss today when you go see some of these bands and it's like well that doesn't sound as you know clean as it normal because you know people strip things down and they filter this and you know and they compress that and i just go for a rawness that's always been you yeah know, my sound and so that's you know do just do it live you know that's that's the main thing do it live do it live <laughs> <laughs> well tony i really appreciate you coming in and uh and hanging out today and uh yeah, it's a pleasure to would be you here. like to play one more thing here before we uh i don't really know i mean um I don't really have just anything. a little bit of something Thanks, Tony. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's all for now. Don't forget to subscribe, ring the bell, and leave a comment. Check out my new Quick Lessons Pro guitar course that just came out. Also, the Beato book, if you want to learn about music theory, that's how you do it. And check out my Beato Ear Training course at BeatoEarTraining.com. And don't forget, if you want to support the channel even more, think about becoming a member of the Beato Club. Thanks so much for watching.